1990, the 80s were gone and a new era emerged. All the prior successes and failures had built up to this moment. This year was the beginning of wokeness in the form we know today. It began with Patricia Hill Collins, who published Black Feminist Thought, which is still widely used in feminist and women's studies around the country. She invoked the dialectic repeatedly throughout the work. Keep in mind that before this time, the link between neo-Marxism and black feminism was Angela Davis. Of course, Herbert Marcuse before her encouraged critical thinking in black liberation movements since he saw them as the ghetto populations he wanted to radicalize. But Angela Davis was his activist protege. She planted the seeds of the tree from which Patricia Hill Collins was picking fruit. By her words, black feminist thought simply existed as resistance to the systems of oppression that affected U.S. black women. And without those systems of oppression, black feminism wouldn't exist. The two exist in a dialectical relationship. Black feminist thought supported any measure of activism or policy that sought to fix the problems generated by any number of intersecting identities black women existed within. Unsurprisingly, Patricia Hill Collins later published a related book called Intersectionality. A man named Mike Oliver published The Politics of Disablement in the same year as Black Feminist Thought and increased the length of the intersectional roll call with the addition of the disabled. A few years earlier, he had coined the term social model of disability, and in the 1990 book, he stressed the responsibility of society to make up for the lack of ability disabled people had. This kind of equity is something nobody minds today. If someone can't walk, they get elevator access or a handicap spot. If someone is blind, they get braille signs or raised dots on the sidewalk. This kind of equity raises the people up who can't do certain things for themselves and gives them the same outcomes as others. But no one thinks this is crazy because, like I said, they can't do these things for themselves. A blind person can't just start seeing. But as Presidents Theodore Roosevelt and Howard Taft showed, with the proper rules set in place and exploitation minimized, under a capitalist system, the lowest of workers can have a good life. But Marxist ideology assumed then, and assumes now, that the system makes people different, and that they can't overcome those differences, ever. How depressing. At this time, H. George Fredrickson was again part of an eclectic mix of ideas brought into the fold of woke ideology. He published Public Administration and Social Equity in 1990 and continued to push for social equity in public administration. He argued that public administration, while at the time neutral and focused on economy and efficiency, should in fact be involved in politics and policy making. To say that a service may be well managed and that a service may be efficient and economical still begs these questions. Well managed for whom? Efficient for whom? Economical for whom? Clearly, he stressed the appearance of power dynamics even in public administration, and considered public administration another aspect of American culture that needed to be disrupted, dismantled, and rebuilt. The next year, one of the most famous critical theorists of the 21st century entered the literary scene. Kimberly Crenshaw wrote the book Mapping the Margins in 1991, where she aimed to delineate between the center, powerful, and margins, oppressed, in society. Here, another key concept is fleshed out. Structural material determinism is the idea that the structure and material of one's immediate culture are what make the person the way they are. There is no balance between nature and nurture, it's all nurture. This is what made every white person complicit in racial oppression of blacks. The fact that they grew up in the white, European, Christian West made them implicitly racist. Think again of MLK's I Have a Dream speech. We should all be judged by the content of our character, not the color of our skin, right? Crenshaw posited that material and structure, cultural aspects including skin color, determine the character of a person, so MLK's dream could never have been realized. Now you see why pointing an identity Marxist to the civil rights movement doesn't do anything. They believe it didn't go far enough. Just look at Angela Davis. Many people previously, in response to the slogan Black Lives Matter, asked, but shouldn't we really be saying all lives matter? They're now finally getting it that as long as black people continue to be treated in this way, as long as the violence of racism remains what it is, then no one is safe. Kimberly Crenshaw also recognized the power of Jacques Derrida's deconstruction, but made it clear that the racial categories of identity politics shouldn't themselves be deconstructed. Deconstructionism just leaves the pieces on the floor. 
and the racial categories were needed to fuel the revolution. Without that fuel, the fire of Marxism would dwindle and be snuffed out. She believed that the act of putting people into categories was some form of oppression done by the people in power, which is in line with the modern thinking that you can't call a child molester a pedophile. It's hurtful and racist. Some identities, however, allowed those categorized and marginalized people to resist the system. It gave them righteous hatred for the system and a love for rebellion. Like people before her and many since, Crenshaw made the distinction between definitions of race. The phrase, I am black, meant something different from, I am a person who happens to be black. The latter is just a marker of someone's skin color, a recognition of how they look. The former is a sign of allegiance with the revolution. There was then a difference between being racially black and politically black. What do you think of when you think of the word race? Merriam-Webster says race is any one of the groups that humans are often divided into based on physical traits regarded as common among people of shared ancestry. But here's a quote from critical race theorists that generally shocks first-time listeners. Race is defined as a misleading and deceptively appealing classification of human beings created by white people originally from Europe, which assigns human worth and social status using the white racial identity as the archetype of humanity for the purpose of creating and maintaining privilege, power, and systems of oppression. When politician Larry Elder ran for governor in California, he was called the black face of white supremacy. And when Kanye West came out in support of Donald Trump, he was told by Ta-Nehisi Coates that he was no longer black. These are examples of separating out the comrades from the dissidents. They don't want liberation from American slavery. That already happened. They want liberation from a boogeyman of their own making. Lastly, Crenshaw wrote that critical race theory is the fusion of neo-Marxism and postmodernism. The neo-Marxists believe in a socialist revolution through identity disparity, and postmodernists believe in the rejection of reason and objectivity. Combine those, and what emerges is critical race theory in essence. She wrote about anti-essentialism, which is the counter to essentialism. Essentialism is the idea that objects have a set of characteristics or attributes necessary to their identities. For example, a circle must be round, and a square must have four corners. Anti-essentialism is the counter to that, as the idea that nothing has necessary attributes. Therefore, there is no concrete definition for circles or squares, or even blacks or women, and you can see how that fits into modern thought. Crenshaw believed that anti-essentialism couldn't be applied to racial categories, otherwise there would be no reason to organize around them. Now you can see the application of double standards in plain sight. The vulgar Marxists were still constrained by reality and truth, since they were modernist. They had rules to work within, a counter-hegemony to build slowly through the institutions. The new Marxists were so effective because postmodern thought allowed for total rejection of knowledge, truth, and even reality. They could do whatever they wanted as long as it forged the revolution. A few more writings round out the 1990s, the decade of the birth of wokeness. 1995 saw Gloria Ladston Billings write toward a critical race theory of education. She lamented the progress that had been made so far in critical theories, saying, Previous intellectuals Woodson and Dubois presented cogent arguments for considering race as the central construct for understanding inequality. In many ways, our work is an attempt to build on the foundation laid by these scholars. She believed the point of CRT was to do just that. The liberationist movement sought freedom from consumer capitalism and other systems of oppression. And from that, black liberation sought freedom from racial oppression of any kind. The focus had shifted and needed to be brought back to black liberation. If it isn't clear yet, let it be known that the other identities found in the web of intersectionality are just useful idiots for the race-conscious CRT pushers. If you are one of those people, you are just being made to carry water for the racial revolutionaries. This kind of thing happened in communist Russia and China as well. At some point you'll either be too much of a threat to them, or not uphold the revolution well enough. And when you're no longer useful, you'll be purged too. Remember that the applause at Joseph Stalin's speeches would go on forever because the first person to stop clapping would be disappeared. History never repeats itself, but it does rhyme. A side note on the practice of purging. This practice is called entryism. In its entirety, entryism includes both the purging of dissidents and the replacement of them with morally aligned conformist comrades. Defund the police is not a movement to bring justice to those harmed by police brutality. It's a movement to replace cops that will keep law and order with cops who will bend the knee to Marxism when the revolution begins. 
During the pandemic, many people lost their jobs due to restrictions on vaccinations and mask mandates. These too were entryism tactics since those people could be replaced with useful idiots. Learn to spot this tactic being used and call it out. 1996 saw Kimberly Crenshaw publish Critical Race Theory, the key writings that formed the movement. If the link between critical race theory and neo-Marxism hadn't been clear enough, this summary book removed all doubt. The CRT movement was organized by a collection of neo-Marxist intellectuals, former New Left activists, ex-counterculturalists, and other oppositionists. She explained that it infiltrated law schools to expose and challenge the ways American laws apparently legitimized the oppressive social order. But really, it was CLS at that point and morphed into CRT after 1986. Critical race theory is explained as being emancipation from race slavery in all its forms. Remember that definition of race from earlier. The definition of CRT cannot get more literal than that. The idea of race slavery having all kinds of forms, combined with the released statute of limitations on historical oppression afforded to them by the courts, gave and still gives critical race theorists some of the most powerful political tools ever wielded in American politics. 1997 was the year when Charles Mills wrote The Racial Contract. You can see how the hyperfixation on race continued even as Y2K approached. Jean-Jacques Rousseau's philosophy made a resurgence here, mainly his idea of the social contract. The social contract is the sum of all policies in society that all members of said society subscribe to in order to be a member of that society. They are fundamentally agreed upon. The racial contract asserted that there was a racial component to social contracts that every white person consciously or subconsciously agreed upon, just like Paulo Ferreri asserted with his hidden curriculum in schools that excluded non-white students. Note that I said asserted. Luckily for Mills and Freire, the basics of postmodernism allow for them to make baseless assertions and have them taken as gospel. 